You know, what? Yeah, I think so. I think maybe if you'll uh, do your introduction slowly, we can let people uh, join us. Sure. So on behalf of William Darrow, our CEO, Malcolm Hohenline, our vice chair and myself, we welcome you to this call on Operation Protective Wall, assessing the damage, trauma, recovery, and costs for Israel. And we have three terrific guests whom I will introduce as we go along and as each of them speaks. Um, as many of you may know, William, Malcolm, and I were in Israel uh, last week. And so we got to see firsthand uh, much of the damage that occurred. We went to Petah Tikva, um, essentially a suburb of Tel Aviv, where we saw the rocket damage from the terrorist Hamas rocket that landed in a densely populated area, forced 50 families to evacuate their homes, created significant damage. Um, one of the buildings will actually have to be torn down and rebuilt. We actually also visited Lod, where there was interreligious uh, fighting and the damage there and the mental trauma there was very significant. And finally, uh, we visited with Ido in Ashkelon to really get a sense of what had happened in a city that had suffered tremendously from the Hamas rockets. And we really saw the incredible damage in Israel that needs to be rebuilt. And we felt it was very important for others to understand the depth and breadth of both the damage and mental trauma uh, and cost uh, of rebuilding Israel uh, after this operation. So it's in that spirit that we put this together. And I wanna thank Miri, Ido, and Talia for joining us. And our first speaker is Miri Savion. Um, she's the first deputy director general of the Israel Tax Authority which has the responsibility for reconstructing the areas that were destroyed and damaged during the Gaza conflict. She's a member of the authority's management team, which sets the policies, goals, and objectives of the authority. She also serves as the authority's senior deputy director general for customer service. And as part of her responsibilities, she's in charge of the compensation fund for property damages. Previously, she served as the Director of Assessment and the Auditing Division. And since Mary needs to leave at 1120, uh, we look forward to your comments. Um, and uh, so the floor is yours, Mary. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for very much for the opportunity to present uh, the Israel Tax Authority and the Compensation Fund activity during the Shomer HaChomot operation. Um, I will try to put on a slide I think it will help us. So I'll try if I can do it, then it will help us here. Um, just a moment. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can see it. Yes, okay. we, can, we can see it. If you can make it a little bigger, that's great. If you can't, it's fine the way it is. Better? Great, perfect. Okay. Okay, so this slide will give us some just to, it will help you to follow my, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, so I will start with a few words about uh, the compensation fund. Um, through legislation, the state of Israel uh, created the compensation fund for property damages uh, to compensate for damages caused by, as a result, of acts of hostility or war uh, operations. The Israel Tax Authority, ITA, uh, in addition to its job as a tax authority, uh, operates actually the compensation uh, fund. In Hebrew, we call it Karen Pitsuim. Uh, the compensation fund manages the compensation to businesses and individuals uh, for damages to their property as a result of acts uh, of hostility or war operations. The fund compensates for two kinds of uh, damages. Uh, there are direct damages and indirect damages. When we say direct damages, we refer to damages to property, both for private and businesses. And when we speak about indirect damages, we are talking about damages uh, uh, of loss of incomes or profits. And this of course refers to businesses. Uh, what kind of events do we cover? 
Um, the fund covers for damages for three kinds of events, uh, wars, terror events, and violence events uh, that are related to the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict. The budget of the fund uh, is coming from the tax collections. Uh, every year, 25% uh, of the collections from purchasing tax on real estate is intended to the compensation fund. And this money uh, is used both to compensate businesses and individuals and to operate the system. Um, the legal situation is not very simple. Uh, the compensation is administrated by uh, under two types of legislation. Uh, we have the permanent le legislation and this legislation uh, covers direct damages uh, in any situ situation that, uh, we, we mentioned, that I mentioned before. And whenever an event occurs, ITL and the compensation fund uh, will operate and compensate with no need for any further or additional legislation. Uh, the legislation also covers indirect uh, damages in border settlements, for example, uh, settlements that are uh, up to seven kilometers from the border with the uh, Gaza Strip. And there is the other kind of legislation. Uh, this is an ad hoc legislation. Uh, while during major security events like we have today, uh, we had actually, like Shomer HaChomot, uh, the Knesset legislates ad hoc and temporary provisions. This legislation expands actually the possibilities to compensate indirect damages uh, to businesses due to war events. And usually the legislation will uh, do three kinds of things. First, it will define the period of entitlement. Uh, another thing, it will expand the, geograph the geographic regions qualified for indirect compensation. And uh, usually it creates fast track channel, what we call in Hebrew, Maslul Yarok or green channel um, for submitting claims to make the process fun, uh, fast and efficient. Usually in, a very, in big events like we have today, we estimate that we will have um, tens of thousands of claims. So we have to do it very fast and efficiently. Um, and digital, of course. Um, during the last days, I must say that uh, there were heated uh, discussion in the Knesset exactly around uh, this issue. Um, few words about the operation of the fund. Uh, so during routine time, ITA has around uh, 10 employees working for the compensation uh, fund. Mr. Amir Daan uh, is the director of the fund. But uh, during an event like we have uh, these days, ITA promptly reassigned tens and sometimes even hundreds uh, of additional employees uh, from all branches uh, of ITA to work for the compensation fund. Uh, some of these employees uh, are resigned within even a single day when we need them. The fund always starts uh, compensating for direct damages. Uh, ITA employees with uh, appraisers visit it, uh, each uh, damage site to estimate the damage as soon as possible. And sometimes we really work under fire. It's not a phrase, it's the reality. After that, ITA pays for damages as soon as possible. Uh, for, in the, uh, for individuals that need alternative housing, this is something that happens a um, lot of times. Uh, IT will, ITA will cover accommodation uh, in hotels uh, for short periods and will cover uh, rent for longer periods. Um, in Shomer Homot, ITA uh, has already processed over 7,000 direct uh, damages claims. Uh, ITA teams are still working to estimate damages uh, in, complex, in complex cases, and we already started to pay uh, the uh, damages for the uh, compensation for the damages. Uh, in order to compensate for the in, indirect damages in this situation, an ad hoc provision uh, by the Knesset is needed. Once it will be approved, ITA will promptly update its online system uh, to reflect the, the specifics uh, on the new le legislative provisions. Uh, to summarize, uh, the compensation fund in ITA 
does its best to help individuals and businesses realize all the benefits that were created by the legislator. It provides fair and fast service approvals and payments while minimizing fraud risks. Unfortunately, even in these cases, we see also fraud. Um, I guess this concludes my uh, presentation. If you have any comments or questions, uh, then I have some time. And otherwise, the, orga the organizer have my, uh, my uh, contact information. Uh, so I just want to thank you until now. Thank you very much. Um, Miri, uh, we, since we don't have that much time and, and you need to go, maybe I'll just take moderator's privilege to ask a question. Uh, one of the things we saw when we were in Israel was just how quickly some of the repairs take place. Some of them really happen very, very fast. So when you say you operate quickly, does that mean you compensate people in weeks, in months? What does quickly mean? Well, I can say that uh, for the direct damages, I can say that uh, until now, we actually paid only, it paid almost 2000 uh, damages until today. And we are going on and paying every day, tens and hundreds as fast as we can. So we try to do it as fast as possible. Um, of course, it depends if the, if, it, if the damage is very complex, it takes some time, but uh, we really pay in days. Um, about the indirect, uh, indirect uh, damage, of course, it will take us uh, a little bit longer time, and we also need the Knesset to decide uh, what, legislated, what legislation uh, is about to approve, and then we can do uh, this, the, this part of our job. And one final question, and then we'll let you go. One thing I didn't understand from your comments was, you know, there was the violence from the rockets from Hamas, but there was also the violence in places like Lod, where there was significant property damage. Does the fund also cover that type of property damage? Yes, as I said, uh, we have these two kinds of uh, damages, the direct damages and the indirect. So in all kinds of uh, events, we compensate for the direct damages. Uh, so even uh, for the damages in Lod and Ramle that are due to the uh, uh, Arabic, Israeli Arabic uh, conflict, we compensate the direct damage. Um, now the situation that for the indirect damage, uh, we can compensate only for um, war events. This is the, legis uh, the legislation right now. So uh, this is a, a different issue, but for the direct damage, I can say that we compensate in all these cases. And one other question, I don't know if this is public or not, but how big is the fund? How much money is in the fund? You said it came largely from real estate taxes, but how large is the fund? It's around, but not, don't catch me on the word. I, I think that right now it's around the 15 billion shekel, but I'm not sure because I didn't look for the data rate before and I'm not sure that I remember, so. <laughs> Okay, it's, well, it's, it's, of like, it's very large order of magnitude. That was really. Uh, I, I will say it this way because when you say that it's very large, it sounds as if it's possible to compensate everything. But uh, we always think about uh, the possibility that we'll have very dramatic events. And uh, we, we think that it is very important to keep the money for the very big events because. If there are large events like uh, the Second Lebanon War uh, or other cases when the war is very long or goes into Israel, uh, that, that very big money can become uh, not so much uh, to compensate businesses um, all over Israel. So we think that it's very important to, to make sure that there is enough money uh, for any cases or any events, even the bigger one. So Miri, I know you have to go because you have this other meeting. I'm sure there may be some more questions from some of our listeners. Would, would it be okay if we sent you an email with any follow-up questions? Yes, no problem. And uh, as I said, my contact uh, information, uh, the organizers have my contact yeah. information, so you can call me and I will okay. do my best to answer. Okay, terrific. 
Um, thank you very, very much for your time and for all your tremendous work in the wake of all of the difficult events of the last couple of weeks and for the speed with which you operate to make sure that the tremendous resilience of the Israeli people is, is assured. So thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate your making the time for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the thanks are for the ITA employees, of course. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, speaker is Ido Livni. He's the Director of Innovation and Strategy for the Municipality of Ashkelon, uh, where he's responsible for multidisciplinary strategic planning. Um, since 2017, he has served as a Deputy District Supervisor in the Ministry of the Interior. And previously he served as Deputy, Deputy District Supervisor of Jerusalem and Supervisor of Authorities in the Ministry and as Director of Marketing Projects and Dis Distribution in the Intellect Group. Um, and as I said, he's the person who showed us around Ashkelon and uh, really gave us a sense of the depth and breadth of the damage there and has been involved with both the physical damage and the mental trauma. So with that, Ido, thank you for joining us and we look forward to your comments. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, I, the plan wasn't to start from the previous sp uh, speaker, but I have to say it like that. that um, for the people of Ashkelon, uh, as I told you in the meeting, the war is already inside Israel. Israel uh, Ashkelon, uh, in the beginning, uh, in the beginning of uh, last month, was in the front line of Israel, but not front line as, as soldiers, ju just as front line as uh, civilians. And the 14 days of war uh, that uh, was fought in Israel and uh, in Ashkelon. Uh, Specifically, was the was a traumatic time for the city, and, and I, I will explain. Ashkelon, uh, for the last two, two decades, was under attacks, but the, the amount of the attacks on the city, or rockets attacks on the city, was minor if you compare it to the surrounding of Gaza. Uh, the big difference started in the two uh, last conflicts, and this one in uh, specifically that uh, Ashkelon uh, was fired by uh, Hamas and the organization, the Jihad organization in Gaza, uh, decided they want to terrorize the city and they sh shot over a thousand rockets on uh, Ashkelon. And as uh, everybody will say or speaks in the media, there is the Iron Dome, but the Iron Dome is good enough for 90%. And the 10% actually landed inside the city. And uh, this the occasion and the other one before changed the mood and changed the, atmos uh, changed the atmosphere in inside Ashkelon for two, re uh, two, reason two reasons. First of all, uh, the magnitude, the amount of missiles that have been shot on the city actually shocked the city by damages. And damages, I'm saying damages to the streets, building, office buildings, and houses that uh, took a direct hit. And you can see the damages on the city. Uh, in the days of the war, there was uh, tens of uh, places then you, that you saw uh, a rocket where the rockets hit. You see the debris, you see the, the damage in the streets. And the damage for us uh, stayed not just only in the, in the war time or in the conflict time. It depends how you de decide to, to address this uh, thing. But for us, it was a war, 14 uh, days of non-stop bombarding on the city, causing the rockets, 75 uh, direct hits was something that changed the mood in Ashkelon. And uh, as the people of Ashkelon saying all the time, we are strong, we're gonna be strong, we support the government, we support the IDF, and every time the IDF need our support to keep on going. But uh, this, the last May was the biggest difference that we saw in the, in the city for a long time. We saw people that actually afraid, people that said uh, out loud, this is enough. We, uh, we cannot take it anymore. We cannot deal with it without uh, major support from the municipality and from uh, the government. I, I have, have, have to say that 
the Ashkel municipality is, is a strong municipality. Uh, even if you compare it, as I said, uh, uh, as you said before, I work for the Ministry of Interior. I know I know what is the what's the situation in other uh, municipalities. Ashkelon is a strong municipality. It, the municipality have ab abilities to recover quickly, to give the answer, or give the solution for the civilians in, in, in the streets and in the houses. But for a municipality that uh, needs to work during the wartime uh, as a rescue organization and as a police organization, and uh, all combined, and at the same time to give the answer to things like social care and uh, trauma care is uh, becoming a, a lot of a lot of uh, work and uh, the burden on the city is, is big and we are trying to trying to make sure that the citizen of Ashkelon and the, uh, are uh, getting all the support they need and then the municipality is getting and sometimes is working outside the boundaries of what the, the legislation is allowing allowing us or what, uh, uh, what the law is say we have to do. We, we, don't, we don't have the possibility or, uh, it, uh, may, it, uh, or we, we say that very simply, we don't want to, to make, uh, uh, to leave everybody, uh, everyone behind or some of the people behind or even, even one person behind uh, without uh, making sure he's getting the support or the help he needs. And sometimes even if the, if the, the Ministry of uh, Treasury uh, acts quickly, but not quickly, quickly enough. It takes them sometimes two or three or four days to get uh, to give answer. It's very, it's very fast. And I, I have to say that they're doing a, a major effort to give the, all the answers in time. But for somebody that uh, even that if the house didn't got direct hit, but uh, now the roof is turned off, uh, out, the windows is blown up, blown away. The municipality sometimes uh, get, got in instead of the government and make sure they got the, the support they need. This is one, uh, one simple. Uh, the other ones is the, the one that uh, the traumatized people, people that finished the war, got out of, got of the bomb shelters, got out, got out, of, out of the safe rooms in their houses, and they felt that their life don't come back to what they was uh, what they are used to or what they they cannot get a lot back together and most of the calls come to the municipality mm -hmm. for help and it's something that i'll try to say that without too much drama it's something that uh, the municipality uh, with all the powers and with all the resources uh, that we have we are uh, sometimes we are we are short with, with the answer that we got, uh, we, that we have to give to the people. And um, sometimes I'm, I'm being, being asked uh, by other people, uh, people in the government, what can we do? What can we do to change the, the situation? I'm telling them there are two things that we can do. First of all, to get life back to normal as fast as we can, to give the people the, the, the meaning that life is going back to normal, school is open, kindergarten are open, uh, job sites are getting back to work as fast as we can. But in the other hand, we have the responsibility to make sure that if somebody is feeling that he cannot cope with the situation, we can give him all the support he, uh, he needs, that he won't be left behind. And th those two things together are, uh, most of the most of our work in, in these days are, uh, uh, are done in those two, uh, two things. Uh, two, in, sorry. <laughs> well, most of the work is done in uh, uh, in this area. This is for uh, as Ashkelon. As I said in the, the visits of William and Malcolm and you, Diana, I um, I told you uh, more than one time. Ashkelon is a city that uh, goes forward. It's a modern city in a modern country. It's uh, the city that, for now, we have uh, people are buying houses. We got more than, more than uh, ten thousand people that are buying new houses in the northern uh, part of the city. The the prices, the housing prices, is going up. It's, uh, if you're looking at uh, in uh, economics uh, uh, from the economic perspective, we are in a good situation. From the other side, we got uh, ten thousand 
uh, houses, they don't have any sheltering. And those people that are in those uh, houses for now, they cannot get out of the situation. They will, people just, I cannot uh, uh, express what they are feeling, but for them, the world doesn't end even now. Uh, I don't know if you heard in the media or people that they uh, uh, looking on the media in Israel, now there's supposed to be in two days, supposed to be the flag uh, parade in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. As this, and uh, just a few minutes ago, I came from a, a shelter house for uh, people with needs. And uh, one of the uh, taker, uh, uh, one of the people there they asked me, does, uh, that, does it mean if the people in Jerusalem goes with flags in the street, does it mean that we are going to get rockets again? I think this is something that I can prepare for the meeting. And uh, as I came back from, uh, from there and she asked me this, this question, it, it's just express everything about the situation here. People are not, are not coping or not have the ability to cope yet because they, mm -hmm. as she told me, the children here don't have shelters. It's something that we, can, we cannot uh, agree we, we, to get by by the situation. As I told you, the mayor is doing everything he can uh, to work with the government to get the funding and the, to get the support the, uh, the Ashkelon and the citizens of Ashkelon need to to find the shelter, to build the shelter they need, mm -hmm. even in the schools and or in the kindergarten. But uh, the lack of sheltering is something that if we are comparing to uh, um, the settlements around uh, Gaza, the lack of sheltering in Ashkelon is becoming the main issue that everybody talks in the city. It's something that everybody on the street, everybody in the old neighborhoods are talking about the lack of sheltering. And this is a situation that we need to resolve as fast as we can. And for now, we don't have any answer from the government. How are we going to resolve this uh, problem? Okay, thank you. You certainly made that clear when we were there. And that is a very big uh, issue and I can understand, you know, how traumatic it is for the residents um, in that regard. When we were in Ashkelon, you shared um, at the end of our meeting a brief video, and I think we were going to share that today also. So is it okay if we share that now? Sure. So Rachel, why don't um, the, the people of uh, Ashkelon prepared a video to sort of give people outside of Ashkelon a sense of what it was like to be there during uh, the, the most recent Gaza war. And, um, and uh, when we saw it, we thought it was quite effective. And so we'd like to share it with all of you. So Rachel, why don't you see if you can launch that and then we'll go to Talia. כן, רפי, אז נאמר שעדכון ככה של הדקות האחרונות בעיריית אשקלון מחליטים בדקות האלו לפתוח את המקלטים כדי לאפשר לתושבים להיכנס לשם להתמגן. שתי פגיעות ישירות באשקלון כתוצאה ממטח כבד לעיר. בניין, אתם רואים כאן גם אנשים של פיקוד העורף, כל ראשי היישובים. So thank you, Ido. We're going to go to Talia and then we'll uh, have Q&A. So if anybody has a question, please use 
the raise hand function. Uh, Talia Lebanon directs uh, Israel Trauma Coalition's initiatives by building collaborative partnerships that form the foundation of sustainable support for trauma victims in Israel and abroad. She began her career in the IDF as an officer working with bereaved families and wounded soldiers. Subsequently, she supervised social workers in private practice and worked in the Israeli National Insurance Institute for treatment and rehabilitation of trauma widows and widowers. Talia, thanks very much for all the work you do, which is critically important to uh, Israel. And thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to your comments. The floor is yours. I think you're on mute. We need to unmute you. Thank you for having me. It was difficult for me to watch the movie, although we saw it uh, live, unfortunately, many times. Uh, I will say that uh, the ITC has been working on a crisis management and preparedness for 20 years, uh, building resilience and working with cities in Israel and outside of Israel, but uh, never has the challenge been so great as it is now. The past, uh, I'm sure you are all aware that uh, uh, nine, uh, 18 and 19, the years of uh, 18 and 19 were years filled with new realities in the South, balloons and fires, our vocabulary is always growing to include uh, new, uh, new ideas that are being uh, used against the population. Then there was the corona and the same teams that were providing care for people uh, during the escalations were uh, recruited again to provide care for people who were in isolation and uh, who were suffering and teams who were suffering. And when the corona, uh, um, I would, don't know if to say ended, but when the corona uh, changed, the wave of corona changed, this uh, uh, war, uh, you can call it an operation, but literally it was 11 days of war for the people uh, in the South began and uh, it, left, uh, it left many uh, people who are suffering from trauma. Uh, we, the Israel Trauma Coalition runs 11 resilience centers in the country, which is a very uh, Israeli model that is very effective and is a service to the municipality to uh, work with the population before, during and after a crisis. And uh, it, uh, the one in Ashkelon, because uh, Ido is with us and because you visited Ashkelon, I will concentrate on it, but I will also say we have resilient centers in the Gaza envelope, which were extremely busy. All resilient centers began operating 24 seven. All of them opened hotlines. We had more than 3000 calls, telephone calls with people with anxiety. You need to understand that during escalations or during shooting, people are reluctant to leave their homes. And so we need to also do home visits for people who are uh, 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 suffering from um, extreme anxiety. And so our therapists were going under fire to do home visits for people who are suffering. I have never felt this uh, sense of, of uh, overwhelming um, work and it was developing every day. We felt our task growing every day. We recruited more therapists. We were uh, operating uh, within the center where people were coming mostly teams, but uh, less, uh, less uh, the population, as I said, we were working outside of the centers and, uh, and they, there were a few things that really changed uh, the way people felt. One, of course, as Ido mentioned, was the intensity and the numbers of rockets never to have been experienced before. This number was never experienced before. Also this time, as you know, there were many direct hits and every hit create circles of impact, not only to the house that was hit, but also to the houses around it. And again, teams needed to go out and calm people and see who needs help. Um, and also uh, the teams were very burnt out. Uh, we really needed to help teams in the resilience center in Ashkelon. We opened the, a resource room where teams just walked in. It was like a walk-in room. They just walked in to receive care and help and, uh, and to be more uh, energized. And the, uh, the, uh, the feeling that nobody knew as always when it's going to end, of course, is extremely, creates a lot, uh, a lot uh, of anxiety. And 
one of the things that really changed some of the mindset of the people was the unfortunate death of the young child in Sterot, Ido, who was uh, hit at home from a sharpener. Uh, and uh, the idea that we are not safe in our own safe room really changed something in the mindset of many people and many families were more anxious. We were also coping with people who left the area. Some of them left on their own. Some of them, uh, we helped the local councils uh, evacuate. And of course, again, the teams needed to go to the places where they were evacuated. And, and I was watching the news and believe me, you know, we've been dealing with so many uh, big crises in Israel and around the world. For me personally and professionally, I just felt the task growing all the time. Every time I heard the news, and I heard the news a lot, it was just terrible to watch. It was, I felt so sad. I, I know it's a, I should be more professional here, but it was just terrible to understand that every piece of news will create more people in need of help. And, and the task of healing takes much longer than the task of harming. And we have such a long time ahead of us to work with children and with families and to see how it is that we can create coping skills within parents. So we are guiding parents and uh, we are working with kids. We are working, as I said, with teams. And <clears throat> what needs to be said and that during an, an emergency, as I said before, uh, people don't usually come physically, but after the emergency, and we know that from previous emergency, there is tsunami of people coming in. And so in Ashkelon, after the after this uh, the firing ended, we have almost a thousand people coming in for therapy. This is a number that you I, we cannot even grasp. We had 200 people a year last year, and now we have a, a thousand new people. And of course, we have the previous people that were in therapy, and we have previous patients where they have reactivation of trauma. And so it was uh, it was it was and it is very, very challenging, which is a very uh, diplomatic word to say it is extremely difficult. And on top of it, we had things uh, um, that we've, you know, we had the event, and just to give you an example, we had the event of the two uh, workers from Thailand who were working in the, in the, the region of Eshkol and were killed. And we, we had, I don't know, sometimes good things happen as well. We found the therapist, an Israeli therapist who speaks Thai. And so we had a group of 100 people from Thailand to explain to them what it is that they need to do in times of, of alert, which they didn't do before, which is one of the reasons they died. We worked really day and night, knocking on doors, seeing what people need. On top of what's happening in the Gaza envelope, you know, is we divide Israel to zero to three kilometers from the border, then three kilometers to seven and which is where the resilience centers are locally, are usually based. This time it was also uh, seven to 40 kilometers and of course, 40 to 80 kilometers. And what happened uh, 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 apart from the security issues that we are unfortunately used to, there were new things that happened. One of them is the, as a therapist, I can say, uh, I was called one day and somebody said to me, I need help. We had a family who was, who was uh, experiencing a lynch. And I thought, you know, it never ends. These new things that we are all need to, to, provi to provide help for, it's, it's very, um, uh, very difficult. And of course, what's happening in the mixed cities is a challenge that we will all need to put our, our heads together to see how we can help communities heal. We need to help, help communities heal in the south of the country, in the middle of the country, and, act, and we, have our, we have our work uh, uh, cut for us. It's, it's a, a very big challenge. The Israel Trauma Coalition works, of course, very closely with the local council. We, we work with the, every local council that has a, has a resilience center are our main partners because the resilience center is the, is the vehicle of the, of the local council. We work with the Home Front Command, and unfortunately, I think uh, uh, um, we all understand, and this is a, this is also a big uh, has a big effect on everybody. We all understand that it's only a question of time until the next time. And you hear people saying, "I am, you know, I'm trying to cope, but I don't know when the next time will be." And I heard somebody very young say this to me, and it's it's very difficult to try and develop 
a coping skills and resilience when you're looking at the time and saying, okay, will it take a year? Will it take two years? And how bad will the next time be? Because every time it's worse. And us, the old veterans who unfortunately are in this field of work, uh, find this, uh, find that it creates one generation, another generation, and third generation of people who are carrying this as young children, then as uh, soldiers, then as parents, and the impact of it is just uh, is just uh, growing. So I'm, I, I, I want to say, because it's, it's always difficult for me when I only express how difficult it is, and it is difficult, I also want to say, like Ido said, that the people are very resilient. I, I'm in awe of the, of the caregivers, of the teams, of the local councils, uh, which said, uh, all of them said that just two days before the ceasefire, that uh, they support the army, that uh, they gave such a message of togetherness and resilience. It is, you feel that you have a privilege to, to be able to be part of this, uh, of this uh, community. But again, the healing process is happening, but it's, uh, it's going to take a long time. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, and I just want to remind people if they have a question, please use the raise hand function. First of all, I, I want to commend you for all your comments with regard to helping your own staff, because I know in this kind of environment, the self-care for the social workers themselves is really critical to their ability to function. And um, so I, I really am happy that you spent time talking about that. One thing that would be interesting to know a little bit more about is you talked about the issues with children um, and with families, maybe how the issues um, are a little bit different for children, teenagers, particularly in the wake of this COVID year, whether the types of issues you're finding are different than what you've seen in the past. So children, especially teenagers, I think the children and teenagers are two different groups. So right. uh, um, children during COVID, families had a very difficult time during COVID, especially in the areas where they had a, they had a need before in the escalations to be in their safe room, isolated from the community. And the challenge of, of, of maintaining a sense of community during, uh, during uh, escalations is, is a, is a big challenge, but also the challenge of maintaining communities during COVID in isolation was a, was a big challenge. As you well know, in the States, you also uh, had the difficulty coping with this idea of how it is that I maintain the sense of community, of belonging, of not being so alone while being in isolation. So children were taken care of by their parents and the, the, the difficulty we saw more were at the parents, especially because children uh, who were in therapy stopped coming to therapy during isolation during COVID. And so parents were stuck at home with children who were suffering from trauma. And we tried many, many initiative, initiative, uh, new initiatives to do through Zoom to do a lot of uh, work with families. Uh, teenagers do not tend to come to therapy. And the isolation also created a, a, a lot of a impact on the, on the teenagers, especially since there were no school. And they just came back to school a few weeks ago from the last uh, isolation. And then this operation happened again. We are recruiting uh, youth to help us, which is a way for us to bring them to our center, but also to watch over them and to see to, uh, to screen if there are any uh, teenagers who need care. And so we recruited the teenagers to work in the shelters, uh, to work uh, doing home visits to the elderly. It gave them a sense of empowerment. It gave us a chance to look at them and see. Uh, we are very concerned, and I will not open this to the discussion now. We are very concerned what we've seen in the last year uh, on the, uh, uh, is on the impact of uh, new recruits to the army who are going with a lot of uh, goodwill and faith and, and uh, volunteering to the best units in the army. And then after a month or two, uh, what we call in Israel, falling from these very good units because they cannot stand the noise, they cannot stand the stress and the, this, uh, this uh, feeling of failure is the last thing that they need. And so in the last year, we are all working very hard on this idea of helping uh, youth get into the army in a much more resilient uh, and understanding mode. 
Ido, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I have to say, I want to say two things. First of all, I have to say thank you to Talia. And we have to say that uh, Talia and our organization are doing, doing a lot of work in Ashkelon to help Ashkelon to cope with the situation. And as Talia said a few minutes ago, uh, dealing with this situation in Ashkelon and dealing with this situation in uh, in, a, in the settlements, it's it's a different thing. First of all, Ashkelon is a, it's a big city, 160,000 people in the city. The the community there, there is there is communities, but it's not a community like in a kibbutz or like in a in a moshav. And the support and the the knowledge and the know how to have somebody in the street or in the next door in the apartment, it's not not exist yet. And uh, Talia did a lot of work with the municipality to help us uh, be prepared just five days before the escalation or 10 days before the escalation. Talia and our organization did a drill, a drill with the, all the people from the municipality to cope with the situation that may come and may not come. And after a few days, the situation and the rocket started. And we have to say a lot of uh, thanks for her for uh, her work. It's she's doing all, she's doing her work with all of her heart and all the people in the social cares and the uh, and the people in the trauma center are doing a lot of work with, above what we are expecting from them to do, just to cope with the magnitude and the, the hundreds of people that are coming. We were prepared to 200, 300 people a year. And in just two weeks, we grow up in the numbers from 200 to 1,000 people that are seeking help. Another thing that I want to say that it's very important to understand that in a, city, in a city like Ashkelon, because people don't, are not recognized or people don't recognize themselves as a traumatized, some of them will come to get help or to get uh, support just in a few weeks or months, or sometimes they won't uh, be recognized as uh, suffering from trauma. And this is one of the, one of the things that we are trying to cope or, uh, to to find a way to make sure that everybody that even they don't know they need help will uh, get recognized as somebody that need help and we will have the ability to help them. So Talia, I have to say we are meeting here and we talked on the phone, but I have to say a lot of thanks for your uh, work in Ashkelon. Great. So Raquel, next question, please. The next question is from Malcolm Holmine. Hi, it's good to see you again. And thank you for your hospitality during our visit, uh, which was really eye-opening as much as we have seen, been there in time of war and other things. When you come and you see the devastation wrought on communities, people don't understand the power of a single rocket as we saw in Petah Tikva, bringing down an apartment building that will come down because of it. And all these surrounding areas and the metal bars that are in it that travel at high velocity and can penetrate through a person and stick in the middle of a tree. Uh, so it was seeing it firsthand was essential. I was wondering whether you could talk about what um, you feel we should do more from here. Our message is communication to give chizuk to the people in all of the cities that were affected. The second, are there, is there still a need for more shelters and is there an effort to raise money to help build more shelters for people in the older buildings, especially. And, and lastly, has there been any outreach by the Israeli Arab communities in light of what happened? I know there's a lot of hostility that emerged from it, but is there any uh, effort on their part to, to reach out to their Jewish counterparts? I, I'm guessing you're asking me. Uh, everybody. Everybody. <laughs> uh, I will answer on the on the sheltering, uh, if I may. I have to say that uh, there is a lot we can do uh, considering the sheltering. There is a lot we can do on, uh, first of all, take care of the old sheltering, make sure they're, uh, they're ready and uh, for uh, staying or to, I would say, that in the right way. We have, we have to make sure that Every exist shelter uh, will be ready as much as we, we can to make him uh, to prepare him to the next missile, missile that come that can come 
in two days time or in two or three years time. Unfortunately, we don't know it. We hope it's going to take as long as the, the Hamas will give us to get prepared for this situation. And we are trying now, as I told you on, the, on your visit, and I'm telling everybody, we're trying to do our best efforts uh, with the government uh, to bring the money to, uh, to the sheltering for the old, old houses. It's a, big, it's, it's a huge project. Uh, and even if we got the money now, it's going to take us at least three or four uh, uh, years to uh, build everything. And in, this, in, the, in, the, in the middle, people want to have the sheltering. So we will want to start as soon as possible to be, to build the sheltering to the old houses. As I told before, there is 10,000 uh, houses without, without any shelter or any shelter that is uh, good enough for this situation. I have to remind everybody, although Ashkelon is not in the seven kilometer area around Gaza, it's just nine kilometer around Gaza. People here have, and, something like 15 seconds to get to sheltering or to the safe room or to the bomb shelter in the street. And just doesn't matter if you're a 10 year, 10 year uh, child that you need to run the three, three, three floors down to the bomb shelter, or you are an you are, uh, old man that need to get out of his apartment and go to the bomb shelter that, that is located outside in the street. It doesn't matter, both of them want to get uh, to the sheltering in time. And, and we need to do everything that we can to, or try to raise the money or in, uh, to work with the government to get the money as soon as possible so we can shorter the time that uh, the Ashkelon people will get sheltering. And it's, it's a big issue. The, the sheltering is a big issue of healing. And I'm sure that Talia will tell you that if somebody knows or feels that he got the, the, the sheltering, it's part of his healing that he knows that the next time you have uh, some place to hide or uh, to get into, to hide from the missile. You ask, as a, as a municipality, the Arab uh, citizen or municipalities or uh, even in the government, now they're in the government, uh, some, uh, some of their representatives, you ask them if they're reaching out. I know that in Lod, one of them did do a reaching out in Ashkelon, we don't have, uh, Arab uh, or Muslim uh, citizen that they live in Ashkelon, but from outside Ashkelon, unfortunately, they didn't need any reach out uh, to Ashkelon to, uh, to help, uh, to ask. Um, but uh, I, I won't say that I'm understanding them, but uh, it, it will be very nice and very polite from them to uh, to uh, do some reaching out to ask uh, what they can uh, do to help, even if it's, you know, just give the right attention to the people of Ash Ashkelon. In the end of the day, we are both uh, living here in uh, Israel and none of us is going to leave Israel. Doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or a Jew or a Israeli or an Arabic, uh, we don't, got, we have to support each other even in these uh, hard times. So it, we have a couple more questions. So Talia, I'm gonna not ask you to comment there. I'll, we'll get the next question. And if you wanna add some comments, please feel free. So Rachel, next question, please. Next question is from Mindy Stein of Amona. Um, okay, first of all, I wanna thank you I am a past national president from Emuna and chairman of the board. So we have gotten reports about all this. Actually, I raised, I lowered my hand because Malcolm asked my question. It was about sheltering because we heard that the shelter in the center of the town was in great disrepair and there wasn't enough shelter. And also, I'd like you to be in touch with us, anything that we can do to help you and keep raise money for you. Uh, but my question was really Malcolm. So I had lowered my hand. I guess I didn't see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you very much. Um, so our last question is going to come from William Darrell. Great. Thank you uh, so much, Tali, and thank you so much, Ido, for, for joining us and for all that you do. Um, uh, my, I want to, I want to, you know, it was intense being here uh, for the, the second week of the conflict, and, uh, and I, you know, Felt traumatized, uh, not uh, sure of uh, when uh, rocket fire might come in Tel Aviv and uh, not sure if I had time to put uh, shampoo in my hair uh, in the shower. 
Uh, and so it occurred to it occurs to me and occurred to us during the trip that that there are millions of Israelis uh, who experience trauma, uh, I'm sure much greater than my trauma, uh, and that uh, in being here, it doesn't seem like the society is focused on uh, dealing with the trauma of Israelis, dealing with the rebuilding of Israelis. All of the talk uh, in the news media worldwide and here, frankly, is about a rebuilding of Gaza. Uh, and I wonder uh, if you can talk about sort of the Israeli mentality uh, which I know is a part of the resilience where you just sort of pop back up and move on uh, to the next uh, crisis, um, political, military, uh, economic, or what have you. Uh, but I wonder how, um, how that sort of works into the, into the fabric here of, of helping Israelis deal with this trauma uh, when the society is so, uh, so resilient, but also sort of uh, part of that resilience means kind of putting the trauma in your back pocket and moving on. And again, thank you both for joining us. So Talia, do you wanna start on that one? Please. Uh, I think uh, William very wisely touched on the secret of uh, the Israelis uh, and many people outside of Israel as well. I think we ho all hold on one hand the understanding of how vulnerable we are, and on the other hand of how many, how much strength and how resilient we are. And understanding these two and holding them together is the way to continue coping with what's happening. In Israel, people understand that anything can happen anywhere and they, are, they, they know that they will, uh, they will have to cope with it and they get as much help as they can. And we invest a lot in the circles of support for, all, you know, for as many people as we can. But people also know that they are resilient. And of course, the statistic, again, I'm talking as a therapist, statistically, uh, most about 80% will heal spontaneously but it becomes more and more difficult. Every round of these uh, fires makes it more difficult to bounce forward and say, okay, we, we experience this, you know, we can get ourselves together as a mother, as a, as a cl uh, clinician, you know, we can move on. It's becoming much more difficult. And, it, and again, and the marathon to, if I can say the marathon to wellness is becoming more difficult because if you want to work with the people and say, you have the strength to recover, you have the strength to help your neighbor, you have the strength to help your children, it goes together with saying, it is very difficult for you and you can receive help. And so being there and helping people recognize their own uh, anxieties and, and the way of coping is, is, uh, is necessary in order to be able to move forward. And, and again, it's a, it's a very big challenge. So Talia, oh, oh. Ido, um, Ido, did you want to say something? I want, I want to say that uh, uh, in the end of the day, when we are looking on the city of Ashkelon, and Ashkelon, although I'm living in the, one of the sentiments around the Gaza, when I talk about Ashkelon, we mm -hmm. see that uh, in, the, in the end of the day, the communities of Ashkelon are, uh, are they have the ability to heal themselves, to help themselves, even though it's a city and a big city and you don't have the sense of community like you have in a, sutter, a settlement with uh, 500 people. So the people of Ashkelon are doing a great effort or uh, they have the, the, the power to, to get themselves back together on the Sunday morning the, after the, the fighting was over and the people saw that in the last 12 hours there were any, weren't any shooting. So in the Sunday, the next Sunday after the end of the conflict, the, the city of Ashland got back together to, to work, to school, uh, to the children, and the children got to the, to the kindergarten. The people are strong. Uh, as I said, the Talia is doing a great job to help the ones that cannot uh, help themselves. But people are trying to or be, are able to get uh, back together, and I'm very optimistic in, in this part. To see a city that was under fire or sitting in shelters for 14 days, uh, and in the just in 24 hours, uh, most of the city got back together. The work, uh, the work that the, the people do and the municipality does in the community, got back together in a full power and, and 100 percent uh, back together. I have to say we are very optimistic about the ability to heal, but uh, as Talia said, we need to be able to look backward and see that we didn't left anybody behind. And if somebody needs help, if it's for a one therapy treatment or a year uh, for treatment, we have to make sure that we have the ability 
to make uh, help the mother or the father or the child to be, uh, get back together. And then I will able to say that if we will have this ability that Ashkelon will be all right. Ashkelon will be strong again. Ashkelon, I'm just saying it, as I said before, is a city that is growing and is becoming stronger. It's a very nice city. You've been on the beaches in the marina. And we are very optimistic about uh, our ability to come back together. I mean, so, um, at, the, at the end of the day that we spent in Ashkelon, uh, Ido asked, did we want to go to the marina and see the ocean? And I hadn't had a chance to see the ocean on this trip. And we said yes. And um, it was the right suggestion because I just want to share with everybody. It was a beautiful sunset. And there were many people out walking on the boardwalk with their families in a way that showed the tremendous resilience. So um, we want to thank both of you for everything you're doing to help your communities, to help the citizens deal with their trauma, to help your communities deal with the cost of rebuilding, um, and really for the tremendous leadership that you're showing um, mm -hmm. for the communities in Israel. So thank you for your time and thank joining you. us today, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. I have to say one thing from the mayor uh, of Ashkelon, Tom Glam, that you met, Diana, um, that the mayor asked me to make sure that tell everybody, thank you for support. Some of you reach out for him, send messages for, through people directly to him, and he want to thank you very much for the support. Sometimes a good word in, word in the evening or a, a SMS text in the evening that we are with you helps a lot, and he thanks you very much for it. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Ido. Thank you, Tali. Tadarabha. Bye. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you all in good times. Better we times. Good. We all look forward to see you in Israel and to host you and in more common time. Thank you for coming in, uh, to Ashkelon. This was uh, it's a pleasure. It's not something we do regularly, but we will now make it a regular stop. Everybody's go. Cool. Uh, welcome in Ashkelon, and we would like to see you and make sure that uh, the, the people of Ashkelon and the citizens of Israel know that they have somebody covering in their backs. It wasn't, it's, it was a great, it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thank you, Rita. Okay.